Thank you so much, Alan. And, and maybe I, I can also add how delighted we are and honored to, to have you as a partner in the great work that we're doing with Andy. I think it's clear that as we move through this planetary emergence, we have to bring in the issues around health, not only in terms of the disease aspect, but also the impact of climate change and biodiversity loss on people's health, as, it's, as you've indicated, through the food lens, through the way in which we grow our food, but also pollution and emissions coming from the wrong production processes and the wrong use of our materials. So it was a very interesting session and I urge you all to stay if you can, as we move now into something that I believe hasn't been brought up enough through some of our conversations this afternoon. And that is, how do we ensure we both bring in the shift in the economic indicators that we need to properly cost externalities, but then that shift is obviously also financial capital. How do we bring the capital to where it needs to go not only to finance change, but also to totally change the systems. And I think that is fundamental as we're moving now into this session, which has been co-partnered with Systemic and also Triados Bank. So I'm, I'm glad that we still have so many people that have joined us. We've been going through all of these sessions between about 100 and 300 people, so it's wonderful. And the Zoom hasn't crashed yet, which is incredible. So I'm very grateful to technology today because I think Mother Nature has told us that we're on track. So that's a good thing. I'd like to introduce our incredible panel today and ask the panel to maybe put their videos on. So welcome Jeremy and welcome James. Welcome Rianne Marie Thomas and also Christopher. And um, if you could all put your videos on so we can see you and move now into, into this very important session. As a full member of not only president of the Club of Rome and, and carrying a variety of different hats, including an ambassador for Energy Transition Commission and the work that I've been doing with Climate Kick through the taxonomy and the technical expert group of the European Commission, I think it's really important as we start this session to realize that through the TEG work, so the technical expert group, through the way in which we now are starting to put a price, not only, but on natural capital and externalities, we are starting to shift the system in the right direction. It's definitely not where it needs to go. And what I wanna do through this session, and um, we hopefully will get Rianne Marie joining us because otherwise we look very gender unbalanced. Um, but uh, hopefully she's, she's going to be coming. Um, what I really want to do through this conversation is have each of you reflect a little bit on how far we've come in terms of the finance system starting to shift the capital where it needs to go. We're still very far away. The planetary emergency plan very much reflects on the tripling of financial capital to renewables the insurance that we start to put a price on capital, natural capital, as well as on carbon. And this is not yet where it needs to be. So what are the key outstanding barriers for us to really start to look at nature-based solutions in the way in which they need to be looked at? To look at technology, both low carbon, circular optimization technology, digital technology as ways to really shift the system. And I guess my key question will be for an inclusive and just recovery, which is the question that we have in front of us today as member states across the European Union, but also the UK, used to be a member state of the European Union, as well as other countries are clearly looking at the green recovery. What does that mean in practice from a financial perspective? We already know that we're getting pushback right now as I speak from certain member states in the European Union against the use of taxonomy and do no significant harm principles and green criteria within the conden conditionality of the funding that they will get from the European Commission within the recovery packages. So how do we really move towards sustainable finance? And I guess the one thing that I 
my opening question and then we can build on this. And I really want to be able to engage the audience and those that are on the video link with us because there hasn't been enough engagement through some of the different panels. How do we really shift this now through these short-term intervention points that we see within the recovery plans, ensure that we don't go back to business as usual, and then how do we move that into a broader change within the finance system? I'm gonna open up with you, Jeremy, so you get to start. And I look forward to what you have to say, not only in terms of the work that you're doing on blended finance, but also the incredible work you're doing through FOLU. We've just come out of a session that was very much looking at the health impacts also of food. I mean, food, security, access, all of these different issues are also incredibly important as we look at the way in which we shift capital. Uh, Sandrine, thank you uh, very much. And, and also for the kind of the breadth of the, uh, kind of canvas that you have offered to us, right? It's, uh, uh, no, um, there's plenty of room for us all to do some painting. Um, mm. uh, I guess it's watercolors, not paint, and they're not oil colors. Um, so look, <laughs> I, um, I am finding myself um, going through a very kind of profound um, journey of questioning some of my own um, kind of um, hypotheses and views about all of this. And, and I mean, you know, I've been very much in the middle of um, the, the kind of, as you say, the blended finance mechanisms, recognizing that we, you know, um, uh, have to combine policy shifts in the real economy with mechanisms that get capital to move more quickly in the right direction. Um, and that we won't get all these things to happen. Not, we'll never get things to happen perfectly. Um, but, but I think that the big shift for me in the last kind of three months in particular has been that I have found myself much more deeply um, engaged in the question of what really needs to be rooted locally and are the changes that we want and need to see actually better, if you will, um, uh, catalyzed in local economies um, and that if I, I and others kind of pontificate endlessly about the need to take a systemic approach which we do but often taking a systemic approach is easier when you can combine public health mm. and social health and housing and green spaces and the food economy and, and bring these things together at the local level. Um, and it, it seems to me that the potential for action in that setting and to, to combine things in ways that are creative and entrepreneurial and, and inclusive is, is central, not just in terms of the economics, but also in terms of, of the politics and also in terms of the psychology of connection between people. So do you have, um, I just have a follow-up question to that because I fully agree with you, but I'm, I'm just thinking in my mind. So what does that look like concretely in terms of financial mechanisms? So that's, so that's. Finance instrument or what, what would be the best? Well, I, I, I don't know. And I'm keen to, to hand over to James at Triodos and others actually, because I think too much of my thinking has been a little bit, around scale and the billions and the trillions mm. and, and may not have been enough about the, the, the power of 50,000 quid here and 100,000 there and, and, and that actually what I think we need to do and to challenge ourselves, including recognizing that we all generate these vast numbers and this vast scale is to think about how do we create distributed forms of blended finance, where there are consistent templates and consistent approaches and all the rest of it, when relearning the same stuff a thousand times. Delivery of those and the activation of energy and the points of connection that are made and the blending that happens, which will be bringing 
social care, care money together with a little bit of infrastructure money along with something to do with the food economy happen more locally and that you're not just blending public and private you're blending if you will different sources of capital because it's only at that local level mm. that i think people can the economic value of a more um and so i think we need to come at the notion of blending differently it's not to say that there's no benefit there are no economies of scale and of course there are we know that right but i think if we want to get the blending and the capitalization of our economy and it's not just financial capitalization because it's about rebuilding natural social along with physical capital we're going to do that well anchor it differently and start our deep if you will sort of operational learning in frankly quite a different place than I've been. I don't want to speak for others, but, it, but it's the journey that I'm on at the moment. So Jeremy, that resonates very much with what we're seeing at a European level. And I'll come to Christopher and Rianne in a moment. Um, and, and James, I know you can build on this as well. But what's really interesting is that, I don't know if you saw, but last week, several of Europe's capitals, especially Central and Eastern European capitals, said that they wanted a green recovery. And these were mayors from the capitals, yeah. not think, national. But it, so what it, they're saying, they're going against what their countries are saying at the national level and saying, we want this. Hence, what you've just said is spot on. What we need to do is work with them then on what that means in practice on the ground. I, I can imagine community approaches to district heating. I can imagine community approaches to the local food economy. I can imagine ways of bringing my neighbor around renewable energy models that don't need to be planted in the middle of Islington, but where we can commit to collective offtake agreements. I can, I can imagine things that don't just create the technical dimensions of economic value, but also rebuild community. Okay. And, and that combination and creating that social capital alongside what we're trying to do on the, if you want, the environmental side, I don't think that's a nice to have, Sandri. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an essential feature of getting it right. And I think our financial approaches have to connect with that, if you will, starting point in okay. terms of building the society that, that will what underpin the environmental outcomes that we need to see. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And James, this builds in perfectly into what Triados has always wanted to do, right? Um, and, and I think that if you could give us some further reflection around how Triodos is doing that, but also all the incredible work that you've done on the responsible banking principles and, and, and we're seeing this move within the banking sector around value-based investment options. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think just taking a quick sort of step back and sort of appreciating how much the landscape has changed in the last few years, I think that you see the mission are now in terms of the development of their thinking on the sustainable finance action plan. You look at some of the things that, that the leading banks in UN Principles for Responsible Banking, Global Alliance for Banking on Values, the, the debate has, has really kind of shifted uh, several kind of gears. But also with things like the, in the progress that we've made, where we are recognizing that the lack of putting a price on something causes a problem, We've also got the parallel recognition that, that that in itself is imperfect, that the routes to scalability that I think Jeremy is sort of referring to there, it's like there's an impossibility for it to be cookie cutter um, and sort of scalable in a commoditized way that finance kind of wants it uh, from, ha from a force of habit to the diversity and the integration of context that is going to be required in order to really be able to make the resilient progress that we need. So I was reflecting on the quest, the direct kind of question in terms of, so what's the barrier then for, for building into resilient uh, uh, economies? And specifically the thing that, you know, there is, it's, it's it, a lot of these kind of positive policies are hanging on a knife edge. What, where does it sort of kind of um, uh, succeed or fall? Ultimately, I think it's about an empowerment of 
individuals, communities. It's, it ultimately needs to be underpinned by a revolution in, in economic literacy, in economic citizenship, um, and the culture that kind of go, goes with that. So transparency isn't just something about disclosing things because it's good to kind of publish data. It's about being able to genuinely empower people with understanding. It was in some of the earlier contexts, I can't remember who said it, Sandrine, today, but we've all suddenly become expert in epidemiology and we've yeah. become quite expert in other carbon, low carbon solutions, but we need to develop that expertise in flows of finance and in order to do that we need more access into exactly the kind of things Jeremy I think you're talking about which is kind of much more on the ground community relevant blended finance some of the things which Triodos is now doing in natural capital working with insurers with with wildlife trusts with water companies on natural um, capital solutions which which in which basically improve uh, water protection and and, uh, and, and, uh, and and flood protection and increase biodiversity. And it's just like, well, there's multiple contributions and there's multiple impacts and there's multiple flows. But beyond that, it's all understandable. And if we've, you know, we've got the capacity to understand it, we need to access it more. We need people to be involved. We need it to become a much more engaged democracy and that's as much on the societal involvement on in being able to invest directly in impact as it is in the societal involvement in the public finance agenda it needs to go beyond just the jingoism of a no a, a nice few alliterative words don't necessarily translate into the the actual policies that we want to see um, and I think that Christiana and Georgieva from IMF was talking about not building back better, but, but building better before. Oh. So you want to think about what are the preventative ways where you can anticipate these, prevent, these sort of preventable surprises. And you can, you can bring in some of these stakeholders who do value the future, um, like in natural capital, like in, in, the, in, in other sectors, and start to start to kind of practice some of this long termism you ultimately um, if you make if you do make money abstract and we reinforce a transactional culture then we don't get to uh, a long termist society and you don't get you don't get a long termist finance sector or a long termist set of politicians until you do so being able okay. to have that kind of cultural shift um, through everything that, that, that comes from, from government, through education, through finance sector itself, in the way that we talk about risks all the time, we have to be able to talk about these other impacts. That will in itself, I think, turn the, the, the public debate and the leadership agenda. Thanks, James. So we, we're really now talking about on the ground, blended finance, where should we direct our capital? How do we bring people in and empower people? And I, I think this is a perfect juncture to get to you, Rianne Marie, because I see you as a bit bridging the gap between understanding what needs to be done at the local level and yet trying to scale it up to the national level. And then when I get to you, Christopher, I want to go further into regional and global, because there is obviously a need to also ensure that we give the right signals for massive investment in the right things in countries who may not necessarily be having the right conversation with their communities, unfortunately. And I, I think we need to take that into consideration because we're also, many of us speaking from a very privileged experience of being able to feel that we have access to our governments and that we have access to our local leaders. What, what do you think, Brianne Marie? Um, thank you ever so much, Sandrine. I'm, I'm still really excited by the points that Jeremy was making about the need to agree. Because uh, the question that you asked us before the session, Sandrine, was what was the one thing that needs to change in order to create a resilient future economy? And I was going to answer it like one of those, you know, it's like the annoying children that when you say, what's your one wish? And they say, I want 10 other wishes. Because I was going to come <laughs> back and say, the one thing that we need to change is to stop thinking that there is a big bang systemic solution here. Mm. So that, that actually the the way we're going to channel global capital is through local delivery and through local solutions. And I, I've, I've come to this conclusion, maybe a very different route perhaps to Jeremy, but by looking at 
you know, a, a very domestic problem, which is one of our flagship programs at the Clean Finance Institute, is you know, how do we channel the 65 billion pounds of investment that we need into 19 million inefficient homes to meet the government's target for our housing stock by 2035, um, which is obviously an important milestone on the road to net zero carbon 2050. And by pulling together a coalition of developers, of uh, charter surveyors, of building societies, of bankers, of academics, we quickly got down to the barriers. And they are they are at a very local level. And I mean that they are barriers not just in planning or in how uh, valuations are guided by certain regulations, but it's even down to such things as bank models for mortgage affordability are based on assumptions of houses that are not net zero. And this is a problem if you actually want to give more value to that sort of home. So the, the point I'm making is, unfortunately, there isn't a magic green bullet. I think enough people have been trying to look for one. And we need to move away from that sort of thinking and start realizing that the work ahead of us is painstaking, it is granular, and the route to scale is actually through actually testing, demonstrating that there is money to be made from certain mechanisms, especially in the natural capital space, where you can actually generate risk-adjusted returns. And then we need to get into a better discipline of actually looking at what were the enabling characteristics that made that project work. And we find what actually leads to a successful project is the superhuman tenacity of one exceptional person. That is not a scalable or replicable model. So the discipline of actually looking at the things that work and identifying what helped, what could help make that work at scale is actually something that I think is the way that we're going to get there and actually move the millions, as opposed to going the other way, identifying the milli billions and the trillions and trying to, is there a giant lever we could pull? Having said all that, I do think a carbon tax would be very helpful. <laughs> I, but you know what? You didn't start with that. And Jeremy, no. I might slap your hand if you do. Because it means, but I know you won't, but what it means is, my goodness, have you seen the change in the discourse? I mean, Jeremy, you started with it, but I'm, I'm flabbergasted at, at where we, we all are now, which is realizing that actually it is about local and scaling that up to have a global or national regional impact rather than the reverse. And, and I think that's incredibly interesting. And most of the new finance schemes that we're seeing are working are those that are starting to look at systems, at bundling, and, and looking at local application. I mean, even the EIB now is seeing that some of its new projects at the local level, at the city level, are much more effective, exactly as you said, Jeremy, in a much smaller capital frame than, than they were what they thought was necessary in the millions and the billions. So Christopher, I'm gonna bring you in and I hope um, that you can bring in also a bit the Southern perspective because I know that that's part of the reason why we asked you and we had some of your, some other colleagues that we also had asked that unfortunately could not join us to bring in a bit more what's happening in, in the South and, and how can we also ensure that there's the right finance streams, not only going in the South, but doing what we've just discussed, which is maybe looking at microfinance and enhancing microfinance or other types of instruments as really supporting Southern communities and shifting the bar. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I mean, I would, I would echo Jeremy's point of saying, um, you know, how long have we got? Um, but, but I'm delighted to be here and, and um, thank you for, for letting me part of, be part of this conversation. <clears throat> um, you know, it's easy to be trite about some of this stuff and, and I'm not a great lover of the sort of north-south. Um, we work and operate in, um, primarily in Africa, but in frontier markets because we think they're great places to, um, to work and to, to have impact, not because they're south or, or, or north or, or, or anywhere else. Um, but, um, but, but as I said, because we think they, they're places where you can have great impact. And for us, um, you know, my answer to the one thing that you would change is 
is getting more um, accountability on that that impact. So, um, you know, Jeremy knows, but we've we've banged the drum for a while that the more people can see numbers about the impact, the more that capital will flow. Um, the green bond market has been a phenomenal success. But um, if green bonds were, um, were essentially um, calibrated their carbon impact, which is totally doable, um, and people could see that if I buy bond A, um, I am going to have a bigger impact than buying bond B, um, then actually capital would start to flow, would start to flow to bond, um, bond A. And, um, and, and that ultimately, the, the, the reality is that those impacts are greater in the emerging economies. So suddenly you get a sort of a, you would, you would get a, premium being paid, uh, or there would be a reason to move capital um, into some of these um, uh, places where ultimately um, we need to get the needle to move. The, the, we don't need the needle to move in California as much as we do need it to move in, in, in China. And then I just want to mention one project which um, I'm 99% sure that Triodos uh, are the backers of so, um, but if they're not, this is going to be a plug for Triodos anyway, because um, <laughs> I think it's I think it's genius. But um, I um, grew up actually. Um, well, my 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 grandparents um, grew up on the west coast of Scotland, and in that area um, in Argyll, which is actually pretty deprived in 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 the UK. I mean, it's a beautiful place, but it rains 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Um, so not many people living up there, but a scheme got developed uh, where with a grant from the Scottish government, a hydro uh, facility was built. And um, as I said, I'm 99% sure that Triodos provided the, 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 le the lending for it, but I may be wrong. But a great bank like Triodos lent the, 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 the lending to this. And essentially there's a cash flow which is provided to the community that they get to spend. And it's now paying for the school bus, it's paying for sort of a library is being established. There's all of these social services which are, are being um, generated by this cash flow from the, um, you know, from the, um, from, from the profit. Now, that scheme could have just been done by a private individual and then it would be that private individual's pension scheme you know from time on but for a relatively modest investment or grant by the government they've essentially created a 30-year annuity of cash flow into that community and i think this sort of joins together what what we see as the the criticality of here we are doing all of these projects um you know, I'd like more, uh, uh, you know, more recording of, of the data. And I'm not sure if Trudos mm. sort of does sort of really feels that they get credit for the carbon impact that that's happening. But what it's also generating is a massive social impact that goes way beyond that initial government grant. And I don't think that, I mean, I'm just putting this up as an example, but I think it comes a little bit to some of what, what Jeremy and Rianne were saying in terms of how do we use you know, government capital, which so often is just sort of spent on, I don't want to say frittered away, but it's, it's consumed immediately. How do we think of some of that as creating annuity cash flows that, that, that can support um, a, a local community and giving that local community the the trusting that local community to say, this is yours. This is your cash to spend. And, and if you want to go and, you know, create a bingo hall, God bless you. Uh, we're not going to micromanage what you do with that. And, and um, yeah, so let me stop that. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. I don't know, James, if you want, if you had a follow-up question to Christopher, I'd like to open up this into a bit of a panel dialogue and bring in some of the questions as we move along because I, I think you bring up some really good points, Christopher. I mean, you are right, right? We don't wanna talk about a North-South divide and in particular, the investment community still wants to invest 
in investable projects. But, but there are several points in that that I think is really important to bring up, which, which many have, have also brought up, especially in a COVID world. So the Club of Rome from the very beginning in the Limits to Growth and Donella Meadows has warned us that there will never be one singular crisis. And as we move through the need to really build resilience to future crises, building on not only this health crisis, but the climate crisis, et cetera, do we still feel that local action is the only way or will we need to figure out again, as has been more seen through the European approach, that through also regional action, this is, this is the best way to ensure that by putting in place strict targets, right, which investors continuously ask for, so signals to the investment community of where the policy is going, and then they will actually match that with ensuring that the capital goes in the right way. So is that still a necessity based on what many of you have said? That would be my first question to all of you. The second is that how do we also ensure that although much of the investment is going in China or maybe going in India, it's not necessarily going, and although you're working in Africa, to a lot of African countries that actually need it or it's going at the national scale and not going down to the micro scale where communities could use it properly. So how do we create that shift? And again, is that through policy signals or is that the need for new governance or what is it that's going to enable that to happen? Because not all investors are going to be going out there thinking, okay, I'm gonna do this because this is the right thing. Unfortunately, the world doesn't work that way, even though we're trying to convince them to work that way. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's my, my question to open up this conversation to, to all of you as, as we move forward and then also to bring in some of the questions as, as you do that. So James, you want to, you want to start because you already had your hand up. Yeah, sure. I mean, just I, I, um, about 20 years ago, I was financing hydro schemes in Scotland and I, I used to be able to remember the names of every one and it's a sort of a measure of success that I can't remember them now, but, but the likelihood is that's a Triodos project. I think what's interesting with those schemes, and especially some of the ones around the Highlands and Islands, and the model of how it's been created isn't just the finance flows, which is absolutely, you know, it's, 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 it's great, but it's also the way in which those business models have spread from some of the people who've been behind them being able to spread their expertise in a way that isn't about a command and control, just sort of the, the classical kind of expansion of a business, but is more about being able to work with other communities. And that's, that's been a model of replication, which is then there's been little variations on different island communities, for example, which has all been about setting context uh, uh, in, into the right kind of um, um, way to be able to engage with, with local people on the local priorities. And, and back in that sort of time, I remember in about 1999, I had a visit from, uh, I think it was the DTI was what Bayes was back then. And and sort of explaining that all this little local community stuff was kind of, well, it's all very nice, but it's all ignorable because have a look at this pie chart, they, they sort of said, you know, at the end of the day, there's only gonna be a very, very small slice of the pie. And all these big infrastructure projects like offshore wind will ultimately be everything and that's all gonna to be top down. And whilst in a way, volumetrically, you could sort of say, well, they were proved right, the, the whole kind of principle in terms of endogenous growth about being able to have the right skills, the right social capital, the way that we worked with lawyers, consultants, everyone around the ecosystem of projects, the developers in those early stages, how that built a body of how you get these things financed. How do you get practically from demonstration to replication to kind of scale up? If you don't have those first slices of the pie, you don't get any pie. Um, and certainly in, in the UK, you know, it took a long time before we were able to make use of our thunderously abundant natural resources and, and ultimately kind of make good on some of those kind of developments. So I think that it is about being able to kind of grow those kind of things within the context of policy, which has got a clear direction. I think, well, in the UK, 
context, I think the Scottish government has been providing a lot of, of clarity and direction in terms of its policies and is reaping benefits from it. I think that there's a, there's a lot of um, uh, areas within, within Europe. I think that there's other things which you might be able to do on a pan-European, or sorry, pan-regional or kind of yeah. cross-regional and some of the links in the EIB uh, in particular in regions like Africa could be quite could be quite interesting to explore. Thank you, James. Jeremy, you wanted to, to speak as well. And I just have a question that's been directed directly to you around how can large scale capital support small local scale initiatives? So in your thinking, if you could bring forward some thoughts about that. Well, I, I think there are a couple of, of, of points. I mean, one is, um, you know, the, the history of, I'm going to say something very grand here, which I should be careful about, but the history of capitalism, right, that's a dangerous start to any sentence, is, is one where effectively money has flowed and become more concentrated in particular institutions and financial centers. And the before that, it's not to say that that's all bad, but, but it has been a process by which, you know, a London or a Hong Kong or wherever it is, you know, ends up controlling, you know, an astonishing proportion of capital allocation for the global economy. Um, and so the, I think that I'm struggling with or wrestling with two questions. One is, how do we actually enable capital to stay more locally? Right, and so that it doesn't all naturally flow out, right, and then get reallocated. I mean, if you listen to, you know, I was listening to Andy Burnham, who, you know, is the mayor of, you know, Manchester, Greater Manchester, and you know, he makes the point that all these tax revenues, right, in Manchester, right, are collected and then flow back to the centre, right, and then called London, called Whitehall, and then some of it on the basis of centrally dictated policies and budget allocations goes back to Manchester, right? And so I think the idea that we, that's a public finance point as opposed to a private finance point, but oh. the same is true in the private. So I think if we want to grow, and I love James's language of the endogenous economy, right? Um, if we want to grow these economies, then we've got to actually create policy and institutional settings that are more aligned by design with keeping more of that closer to the ground and then allowing these connections to happen. Um, yeah. And if you had more of that local capital, that was, I believe that, and we've seen this in so many blended finance models, if you've got some of that local capital and more of it, then it actually is incredibly good risk mitigation for any, if you will, non-local capital that wants to come in, because if the locals are willing to invest in their own community, the chances are that that, if you will, capital that's coming from outside might well have a better chance of, of being deployed well. It all, of course, has to connect with one other thing which, which um, Edge offered us, and, and which we have today and we didn't have 10, 20 years ago, which is the ability to, to use kind of analytics and data and see things transparently and measure things. And so my plea is that the, the story of being more locally connected and, and, and locally kind of creative should, I think, be allied with a plea for more data and better analytics, because I think the two can go deeply hand in hand. Mm. So I, I don't see a contradiction. And I think Rianne's argument around the way in which we need to think through who gets mortgages and how capital gets out is part of the same phenomenon. We can, we can, make, we can bring the power of globally, if you will, best-in-class analytics, very good data, with just a different starting point to the process of capital formation. Yeah. You know? Excellent, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to come to both Christopher and Rianne. Marie, I'm just kind of trying to bring in some of these questions because I think what you've just done, Jeremy, is answered one of the questions, which is around avoiding exploitation of the weak. Because one of the ways we do that is by coming back to local communities. 
it also then enables us to build the resilience because we're starting to manage these communities in a very different way. And as you say, we need to shift our governance models and our policy to underpin this shift because otherwise it's, it's not going to work. And we're giving totally contrarian signals. We're seeing that right now in terms of the way in which the European Union is looking at its just transition fund, its state aid, its cohesion fund and regional funds, its MFF and European semester, and Euro Europe Invest or InvestEU, which all of them are saying different things and are creating total confusion. And I want to focus now on, on the just transition element and ask you, Christopher, and then you, Ria Marie, how, how do we then bring in this, in particular in a recovery world where a lot of countries are strapped for cash, strapped for investment, and wanting to just hone in on business as usual, when this is actually the time to really create the transition that we need, but also bring people on the journey. How do we actually do that? I know I'm, I'm really posing, a, I mean, if we've solved it, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in, right? But I'm just trying to unpack some of these tensions. So I, I think, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the crisis has, has been good in, in some ways. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, in, in some ways, while we, we talk about all the local stuff, I think it's, it's become even more than that. It's been extremely personal to, mm. to everybody. I mean, it's, it's, you know, look, I would normally, we would normally be in a room together, but, but yeah. here we are in our homes. Um, and I can see your home. So I know what your home looks like now. Whereas and before can, I wouldn't have been can, able and, to. And, and you can see my home. Yes. Um, but I think it's, so to some degree, it's got us all thinking very, very locally, but it's also got us thinking about, it has got us thinking globally. And you know, we, we realize that there is, um, that the, 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 the planet and, and what happens, um, you know, sort of globally does matter. So I think to some degree, I know this is going to sound weird, but there's, there was before a lot of localism and a lot of, you know, um, you know, blah, 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 country first. And, I think that actually in some ways that this has been quite successful in breaking some of that and realizing that that, that model also doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and I think that in Europe in particular, where you've had these um, pretty extraordinary actually uh, furlough type schemes that have kicked in and, you know, literally the rule book around um, fiscal sustainability and and uh, all of these other things that I, I'm going to say something very wrong in the um, in the global financial crisis, and um, you know it uh, belayed a real weakness in the monetary system. Um, you know those the great thing was those lessons were learned, and and this time people, governments just didn't blink. They stepped forward. Um, extraordinarily and w but equally and we heard it in the UK on the news yesterday which is something that you know would have been uh, just just totally impossible a, a few months ago um, you know a conservative prime minister standing up and saying we are we are gonna have to pay for this and I mean mm. we, we will have to we've got to get the economy going and, and we will all have to we, we're now in in debt and I think people, you know, feel they, they value their, they value their hospitals more. They value what government's doing for them more. So I think it's reset some of that dynamic with uh, between government and the individual a little bit. Um, and getting that to sort of helping that channel into a sort of uh, a, a a, a better, juster, more dynamic, whatever, um, is, is the challenge that's before us. In truth, it's the challenge that's always before us. I mean, I, I don't feel it's any different. I don't feel that the climate challenge or the, you know, the social 
just this challenge has changed between now and, and, and January. I, I think it's exactly the same. But I do think that it's like the citizens have all had a, a little bit of a wake up moment. And so how we capture that energy and work with that energy and uh, to, you know, quote unquote, use the, this word that's getting trusted out all the time of build back better, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is, is an opportunity for us. But, but I, think, I think people are more engaged. I would argue people are watching the news more than they were before. Um, and thank God we're not talking about Brexit anymore. Yeah, that, that I would agree. <laughs> now, Rianne Marie, it's really interesting because this morning, actually, um, Johan Rockström said, or this afternoon, God, it feels like it was this morning because it was five hours ago and I've been on Zoom chat the whole time. Um, Johan said to us, what's phenomenal through the convergence of the crises, climate, biodiversity, and now COVID, has been that science is sexy again. And, and I thought immediately of, well, interestingly enough, so is energy efficiency. And I'm thinking about this as we're going through this conversation, because if there's any area that had to somehow gather the imagination of people, whether it be from an investment perspective or a policy perspective, it was those that were pushing for energy efficiency. Because it was kind of the boring demand side rather than supply side. I can cut a big ribbon in front of a windmill and I can cut a big ribbon in front of an oil tanker, but I can't cut a big ribbon, although you can, in front of a bunch of houses that are now much more energy efficient. And so it seems to tie up a little bit in terms of this local conversation. And I know you've worked a lot also on the energy efficiency side because the gains are phenomenal. And, and yet it's been so difficult to crack that nut, but it brings us back to bundling, to how do we actually think of local needs and housing, which comes back to the policy side as we know that mayors are very much concerned around housing, even more than the climate emergency or other things. I could go for Britain around housing, actually, so you possibly don't want me going in that direction. We've just uh, published a report with 20 different uh, projects and demonstrator ideas about how we can overcome some of the barriers to financing housing. Uh, so I would point anyone in, in that direction. I, I really wanted to pick up your point about science um, in that I think there are two things as we emerge from the, the tragedy of this pandemic that um, I think will have a lasting impact on the way we look at green finance. One of them is definitely about the importance of science. Um, you know, whenever we have uh, the Prime Minister in the UK talking about whatever next steps he's going to take, he's flanked by scientists. And actually that evidence-based thinking is something that I think is gaining more traction in a way that before there, was, there were people that really were struggling with that concept. But I think the other is, you know, in the, when we think about green finance, the, the greatest, greenest strides that I think we've made as a financial community to date have really been about trying to improve methods of climate risk analysis. Mm. Obviously really important, integrating climate risk as financial risk with the, with the objective of improving the resilience of the financial sector and obviously protecting financial assets and, and ultimately integrating climate risk so that we can differentiate the cost of capital for low carbon investment. What I think we are, we're starting to see a shift in this narrative, given that we are talking now about recovery and we're talking about sectoral transformation and pathways. We're actually bringing finance far more into the discussion of how do we connect the real economy. So Chris mm -hmm. made a point earlier, and, and I, I fully intend to die on the hill of trying to get government to move towards more guarantees rather than grants. So the idea of this, this huge and unprecedented amount of stimulus that is coming out from government, we could be creating new markets. We could be creating new opportunities for private finance. It's particularly pertinent when we start talking about natural capital and to bring it home. Yeah. Now, post-Brexit, sorry to say the words I'm doing, but you know, the, there are going to be a number of finance mechanisms looking at land management and environment and natural capital recovery. And these conversations need to be, and these policy pathways need to have the benefit of private capital in thinking about how do we make these pathways investable so that we can actually leverage public balance sheets. 
which is again coming to the point, there's a point you made earlier about the you know, multilateral institutions and all the rest of it. I, I, I see no tension in continuing to support the need for large multilateral institutions that actually um, direct capital. But what we actually need in order to deploy that really efficiently is a genuine and granular look at what are the barriers to why the capital hasn't been flowing in the first place. Yeah. And actually working in a far more collaborative way right across industry and across finance and across policymakers to actually have very honest conversations as to why the risk adjusted returns haven't been working. Because we're in a co we're in a competition for capital. If I hear again someone telling me that there's more than enough capital, capital isn't the problem. I find that peculiar thing to say because clearly we're always competing for capital and investors will, as you said earlier, they, they don't always do just something because they think it's right. They'll do something because it moves their return hurdle. And in many, many cases, that, that just isn't the case at the moment. So it's, it's the work that Jeremy's doing on blended finance is obviously trying to address that very head on. How do yeah. we create the right yeah. risk adjusted return? Yeah. I'll leave that there. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm trying to close up here and and bring in um, two things as we close. Coming from the questions, one is to to address the the issue that you kind of just addressed, Rianne Marie, which was around you know we have had this is a question from Sydney around community energy groups that made a lot of progress through um, feed-in tariffs, and, and in fact, we saw this a lot through Central and Eastern Europe. And, and then, you know, the policy died, the signals weren't there, and this is very similar to another question now that has come in around how are we really going to shift multi-billion dollar fossil fuel companies if they also keep on getting contrary signals? And, and so I think we all know the answer is we have to have policy, and we have to have agreement. And, and part of that is ensuring that the MDB, so the multilateral development banks, are Paris aligned so that no more public funding goes towards what's brown and that most of the public funding goes towards green. And then the policy signals in terms of objectives of phasing out fossil energy must also be there as we're seeing with the climate neutrality objectives and the phasing out of fossil fuel across the European Union, but in many other jurisdictions. So I, I guess the final question that I would ask you though, would be, we've, we've spent a lot of time and I'm really heartened by this discussion. I actually think it's a new discussion. And if people kind of chimed, came into the discussion and thought they were gonna get the traditional conversation around capital flows and how to invest, et cetera, et cetera, that hasn't been this conversation and that's perfect. Because I think what it's done is it's actually focused on what is real. Many of us have been working in this field for ages and we see that it's not working. We see that the capital is not going to where it needs to go. It also links in with the beginning of the planetary emergency launch already three hours ago, which was that I announced that we've now have something like 17,000 planetary emergency declarations or climate emergency declarations in 30 countries most of them at the local level. So if you link up those declarations with exactly what you've all talked about, which is localized finance, bundled finance, focusing there first, wouldn't the trickle up effect rather than the trickle down effect be much more effective? And you couple that with hopefully the right signals from MDBs and also from many of the, the other governments that are starting to shift. Any final thoughts from, from you with, in regard to that? I've just got a, a couple of thoughts just building on, on Ria Marie's. I mean, I think the first, the, the first one is around sort of this, this, uh, the agenda of risk integration has been absolutely necessary for, for financial institutions. But we're at the cusp now where it's the mirroring accountability for the impacts. Um, and specifically, how is it that, that financial institutions are going to be able to help the transition and write even any deals in the, in the transition? Because if there are, and I'm a massive fan as well in terms, of, in terms of guarantees, where there's going to be tail risks, I mean, in terms of energy efficiency right now, if you're, if you're retrofitting um, 
a, an office building in the centre of a city, well, who's to say if it's going to be populated? Yeah. I mean, who's going to yeah. offices? Yeah. There are going to yeah. be certain Good tail point. risks which need to be taken care of, but then the rest needs to be bankable by virtue of banks working with the business, with the communities in different ways to piece everything together. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to write any business. And I think that that shift in, in business model, that shift in lens towards what is our direct um, impact going to be? What is it we can be accountable for? Not just what are we protecting ourselves from, which absolutely is necessary. But I think we've just gone well past that now. And there's projects which, which we're working on um, together. In fact, so Bankers for Net Zero, and there's some other investigations which we're kind of trying to kind of promote how can we make these leaps now into these new markets? And if, if, the, if the support mechanisms from governments and other stakeholders are designed in the right way, then it sets the right stage for the, for the, the right form of financial innovation to be put forward by financial institutions. Thank you, James. Jeremy? Look, I, I think um, I'm struck and I'm going to um, build a observation um, the, the fact is that people in this country were unhappily ignorant about the extent of EU funding mm. for multiple things um, and we you know I think that I will I will continue to argue the case for good policies at the national level and and you know that you, you can't get away from the fact that our systems are like Russian dolls, right? I mean, we've got the local and we've got multiple layers of the system. Um, my learning of, from the last months and, you know, particularly sharply in the last few months, is that if you build all these systems in a way that lacks the sufficient foundational elements, right, where we can ladder all the way down and people really can see the benefits right of the capital flows and that those and that we can then account for the benefits going back into the system right if in the absence of proper laddering all the way down then not only do we take greater risk in the end to the financial institutions than they perhaps appreciate right but we we also effectively create a series of unintended political risks right which can turn all of the economics and the best models upside down so i, I think we, we recognize the moment we're in um and you know embed within it um you know and i think it is a hard task how as we build the kind of financial mechanisms that we need do we make really strong and effective and, and cost effective kind of approaches to con connecting the local with the, if you will, the, 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 the national? And just the last observation that I would make is that everything that we've seen on the international development capital front, and, and Ned, you should jump in here, keeps on saying that when you get this right, it is when you combine local capital mobilization with international capital yeah. if you will that 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 complements it um but that international capital on its own cannot actually substitute for mechanisms that mobilize and 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 helps sort of develop kind of the local capital um formation christopher or Rianne marie do you want to build on that thought or anything else you want to add before we close if um, I may, okay. oh, yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 that's fine. I'm going to be very, very brief. I just think in the same way with it, um, on this conversation, it's quite a new conversation, I guess, thinking about how we scale up the local as, a, mm. as opposed to how do we go for the big bang. Um, I think one of the things that's been a little bit unhelpful in the whole climate discussion is that we have divorced, we've divorced it from the social discussion. Previously. Yeah. We, it, we were the guys who can measure the carbon reductions we're the guys that actually have all that you know the science behind it and it's so much easier to measure and build business cases rather than some of the other stuff in the social sphere which is part of the measure but i'm actually starting to wonder whether we should be looking at some of the models in social impact 
the sort of the community models, the way that they have been over the years. Um, you know, just uh, you know, just thinking about how they have managed to blend some of the, these solutions that Jeremy's touching on, mm. and whether there are some lessons for us to learn there, and maybe a little hubris from the climate fund green finance community that we could actually yeah. flip that around to. So I just I, I leave that as a as a thought that's occurred to me as I've been listening to the other the other panelists and what's been a really really interesting conversation. Thank you. So I think you're absolutely right, Rianne Marie. And what I would say actually is that if we don't do that, we're going to lose. And the reason for that is also because through COVID, we cannot just disassociate the social from the climate. Otherwise, no one's going to come on this journey. It has to be around healthy people, healthy planet. It has to be around social implications, coming back to basics, what's essential. And it can't be up there in terms of carbon emissions all the time. It has to be, how does this impact you on a day-to-day -day level? And, and I think you're right. I think learning from social impact investment and, and the social community that have been able to do that much more at the local level would be incredibly helpful. Christopher. So, um, I, I mean, I just finished by saying one, I've really enjoyed this, this conversation and I hope all the <clears throat> others who are, who, are, who are listening have. I've noticed our attendee numbers have gone down, but maybe that's because we're, we're hitting the, the drinking well, hour in, <laughs> yeah. in, in Europe. Which so. I hope you'll all stay with, by the way, because we will have a drink. <laughs> um, but you know, to me, the the there's there's two ways of doing this. We can either talk about it, or we just roll up our sleeves and start doing it. And you know, we took inspiration from groups like Trodos, who mm. who came before us. Um, you know, and and when we blew out of of the big bad bank um, and started just trying to do this on the ground. Um, and it's, it's, it's not always a bed of roses. And, and certainly, um, you know, if I was, if I, um, my wife would say that I should have stayed with the big bad bank. Um, but, um, you know, it, there's just an increasing community and it's becoming easier and conversations like this and the support we get from uh, from, you know, from the EU, from KFW, from the British government, from the US government um, is, is extraordinary. So it, it sort of, my view is it, it behooves us to grab those little straws yeah. that get thrown to us and, and, and turn them into, into bricks and, and build houses out of them. And that's what we're doing. And, and we, we just, but, but I'd just say, I, I, th I don't think this will end with this conversation. It's, it's a journey and, and we're just going to make sure that we make the best very messy COVID situation. So let me finish there, but, but also say thank you for, for having me. Thank you so much. And, and thank you also to, to all of you um, for being so open in this conversation and, and, and bringing up some really heartfelt thinking around how we need to shift the discussion. I really appreciate that. The only thing I would add is I wish we had had an economic conversation following this one or previously so that we could have started to link up the well-being indicators, donut economics, because especially for going into the local elements, we can already start to see that there are cities around the globe that are applying very new types of economic systems thinking um, in comparison to GDP thinking and, and pure net profit thinking. And I think that will also drive clearly value-based investment and vice versa. So thank you for, for this fabulous session. Um, I know that there are several new works and in fact, Hunter Lovins suggested that we all go and read Michael Schumann's new book, Put Your Money Where Your Life Is. And um, I think that's probably a pretty good suggestion. But in any case, at least we've kind of tried to put our, our thinking and our money where our mouth was um, in terms of this conversation. And um, I would now like to propose, if you would like to join us, to, to have a drink with the broader community of, of actors that joined us actually during this entire afternoon which was a, a celebration really of this anniversary of the Planetary Emergency Partnership. Um, not that we should celebrate the fact that we're in an emergency, but we should celebrate the fact that we're bringing like-minded champions together to really make a difference. And that's what we wanted to do today. 
and to mark the fact that it's been one year since we were focusing on the convergence of two tipping points. We can now focus on three tipping points, but we also are broadening the community of champions and that's an amazing. So thank you very much. And can I ask my team, Tom or someone else, if we should stay on this link or go on to another link? Okay, so to join the toast, there is another Zoom meeting and that's been put in our chat. And I think everyone else who is saying that they will join the toast are already on that link. Thank you again, stay safe and keep on messaging. Sandrine. Take care. Bye-bye.